The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on July 26, 2021. 11.03 a.m. An endurance athlete named Reza Bellucci tried to run to New York City from St. Augustine in a floating hamster wheel. He ended up 30 miles south of where he started. Also, apparently, he ran around the outside of the contiguous United States. That was 11,720 miles in 202 consecutive days. That is an average of over 58 miles a day. That is insane. But then again, so is trying to run to New York City from Florida on the water. That first part is unfortunate. Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the Brothers Drew Yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about Reza Bellucci and his human hamster wheel. Maybe we'll talk about hamster hamster wheels. Maybe we'll talk about bad ideas, Florida man, children of the corn, or evolutionary biology. But we haven't plotted an exact course because we want you to join us on that journey. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. Alrighty, well this is the point in the show where we usually take a look back, but before we do that, Brother Brad, are you aware that we have a blood drive team? I am, but I'm still a hermit and recluse, and the pandemic only made things worse, so I have not actually participated in the blood drive yet. Well, that's all right, because Brother Jeff went out on a Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. this past week, gave another bunch of blood, got some fruit snacks in return, and although our stats haven't bumped us up yet, I know that we'll be climbing the chart soon. Sadly, our team still only has one member, but in spite of that, we're still doing all right. We're currently in a tie. I'm not sure if we're in a tie with Lazardo anymore. I couldn't find him. But we are now tied with the Children of the Corn, and we're also tied with an entire university. Can you guess which university? The University of the Children of the Corn. Oh, so close. It's the University of wisconsin Platteville. Are they the people who invented platelets? Sure. Aren't those in blood? That's true. Plateville? If we could take out wisconsin Platteville, that would be great. So maybe my latest donation will do it. However, if we do manage to get above the Children of the Corn, Wisconsin Blood Plateville, and Lizardo from the last time that I mentioned it, we will still presumably be a little bit behind some other teams. So I still hope that our listeners will go out and join. And maybe some people are already giving blood. All they need to do is go on to that Red Cross app and just link themselves to the Things I Text My Brother team. In doing so, then maybe we can catch up with people such as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're only trailing them by something like 200,000 lives saved. We're a little bit closer to both Harvard and Yale. They're both hovering in the mid-70,000s in terms of lives saved. For the Church of Latter-day Saints, was that just lives saved with blood donations or lives saved in the name of Christ as well? I have no idea. All right. We are, sadly, and this will possibly interest you because it is us looking back a little bit, even though this is not our ablution or edification. We, with our current position of having contributed to saving 10 lives, are about 90,000 fewer lives saved than a church that you are well acquainted with. It is the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Oh, good on them. Taking yeah. their colanders and giving some blood. Yeah, they're not quite up there with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but they're trying. And listeners, we hope you come join us so we can help save people too. At some point, I will do that. I do want to say, though, that I feel like Children of the Corn versus Lizardo would be a great (laughs) B-movie. Maybe if we ever start generating our own AI screenplays, Lizardo versus Children of the Corn. Computational creativity at its best. We have a concept to feed in so we can let them read the Children (laughs) of the Corn. Or is that, was it a book or just a movie? And then we can let it read scripts for giant lizard attacks and make a script for us. I think you've gone to something. We'll just call the Battle Dome the quad of the University of Wisconsin Platteville, aka Plateville, and it is on. 
So everybody, thanks for joining our blood team. And oh, by the way, while you're doing things, not just to help the world, but if you want to help us too, tell some friends to listen to our show. We are growing. We're in over 20 countries. We're getting big downloads. We have some plans for some cool stuff coming up that might help grow the show. But first things first, we just need people listening. So please go out there, tell a friend, an enemy, a total stranger, or an Eric Need. But with all that out of the way, and before we float back to our original text exchange, we need to take a look back because it's always important to make time to cleanse ourselves of our past sins and to continue our boundless quest for self-improvement through worthless information. Thus, it's time for ablutions and edification. But today, I don't even know if we're going to do an ablution or an edification. It's more akin to an edification, but... I'm not going to claim this is actually going to teach anybody anything. So since we have different categories, ablutions, edifications, ablutifications, I'm going to add another one, which is an adification, where we just add a few comments about something we talked about. But do we learn anything? Not really. I'll be the judge of that. Well, Brad, have you ever watched the television program known as Yellowstone? I have not. I do not have access to said television show. So Yellowstone is a very popular show here in the United States. Many of our listeners are undoubtedly watching the same show. It has Kevin Costner out on a big ranch in Montana. And really what we get is a soap that takes place in an incredibly beautiful place with a lot of melodrama and spoiler, a few people die here and then, which is where this becomes something related to one of our past episodes. Do you remember episode 11, Lawless Loopholes and Lost Dakotas? I do. There's so much drama in the YNP. (laughs) Yes, there is. Well, within that show, I'm not going to recap the whole thing. If you want to know all about the Lawless Loopholes, go back and listen to episode 11. But it's basically talking about this piece of land that would have been uh, right where Idaho, Montana, Wyoming all connect. There's an area that falls outside of the jurisdiction of certain law enforcement. And even more so, there's not really a jury of anyone's peers that can be formed within that area to try anybody. So in theory, even if it's just an academic theory, people can get away with stuff. Well, I happen to be watching this television show, Yellowstone. And for the first three seasons of this show, They're always driving out from the family's ranch, which creatively is also called the Yellowstone, right on the edge of Yellowstone Park. And when they need to, well, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler. They kill people right from the start in the show. When they need to make somebody disappear, the phrase is, take them to the train station. Well, the train station just involves a little bit of a drive. And in the show, they actually are seen crossing into this barren stretch of nothingness in Wyoming, which is not where the loophole land that we read about is, but it's it's clear that they're going for the same concept. And just last night in watching an episode, which was maybe like a year old, one of the characters actually was driving with another character out to the so-called train station, which again is just a barren patch of road that happens to have a cliff, and they throw the body off the ledge. And the person who hadn't worked at the ranch as long is essentially asking the one character some questions. And he asks him, why do you dump him here? And the character that's giving us the information says, well, no one lives within 100 miles. It's a county with no people, no sheriff, and no 12 jurors of your peers. Does that sound familiar, Brad? They listened to our podcast. Did they give us credit? (laughs) Oh, well, it, they, they had to use a time machine to do it because ah! that episode came out well before and was probably filmed a couple of years before. Drats. During a little bit more of the conversation, it was revealed that everyone from three states around dumped their secrets off the cliff. So again, that would be Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. But he then says, want to know how the West was won? The skeletons at the bottom of that canyon is how. So, loophole land. You mentioned in our original episode a potential legal challenge to it, I think, which was on Montana land. You also mentioned somebody who had used it as the plot in a book. I did. I just couldn't believe myself when I was sitting there watching that show and I realized that this so-called train station I'd been hearing about you know, once every handful of episodes for three seasons of the show was a place that we had done a podcast on. That is my adification. It sounds like there might be enough traffic there that you could have sold some slush puppies. <laughs> Indeed. Brother Brad, it's time to dig into the real part of the podcast. What do you have to say? This all started when I saw a headline on BBC News that stated, Man in contraption washes up in Florida after trying to run on water. Mm. Of course, 
I, as someone who enjoys running and reading about crazy ideas, especially when connected to anyone remotely referencing Florida Man, perhaps. Florida Man. Right. Yeah, we'll we'll let people do their own Florida Man thing, but it shouldn't be lost on anyone audience. This is a Florida Man story. So anyway, so I had to check it out. You know, I had to see what the story was about. Mm-hmm. Uh, needless to say, I was not disappointed. <laughs> this gentleman, Reza, or Ray, as he called himself, Bellucci, was trying to raise money for charity by running about 1,000 miles. Hmm. But nothing too unusual about that. I mean, yes, it's a long way, but people do that. They ride, they run a long way. It happens. Yeah, sure. But the fact that he was attempting to run that distance in a hamster wheel-like contraption of his own design <laughs> that he built himself, he's a mechanic and engineer, mm. that part was amazing. Yeah. One, to think, I'm going to raise money for charity. I'm going to do running, but I'm going to do it in a homemade device floating on water. That takes some chutzpah. Yeah. And you said he went backwards on this trip. I do recall seeing that he had, had made other trips. Was he always trying to go the same place? Did he ever make it any further? Did did he have any success doing this? He wasn't always trying to go to the same place. And actually, when I was reading for this podcast, I originally read it was New York City. There is some discrepancy. I saw several articles saying he was trying to get to Bermuda. I looked up the distance Both are about 1,000 miles away from St. Augustine, so I guess it could have been either. But the New York Times said New York City, so I'm going with New York City. Yeah. Are you sure it wasn't a a different voyage? Because I know he did try and get to Bermuda, and we've heard that he tried to get to New York, but I don't know if they're the same voyage. Articles I was looking at had the same date in July of 2021, so I'm assuming there was some discrepancy there. But yeah, it was his third attempt. He had several different designs. He was exploring how to make this work right. Yeah. So this was called a hydropod, so it actually it's not a hamster wheel. But needless to say, this wasn't really a slapdash attempt. He's truly a mechanic. He was building something. He had a satellite phone. He had a GPS. He had food. He had supplies. He had a hammock that he could hook up inside and <laughs> sleep on if he was tired. He had a bicycle helmet and a harness to hold himself in place during storms so he didn't get thrown all around if there was a bad oh, storm. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I wondered. I'm like, was he just going to be in this really hot bubble, you know, spinning around? It's going to be like a million degrees. And oh. so he had all the right equipment. And one of the articles I read said that he actually called the Coast Guard himself after he had moved back for 30 miles due to the fact that his backup GPS wasn't working and his charger was stolen. So somebody swam out to him out in the ocean and uh, robbed him of his backup GPS and things in the water. I believe it happened before he left. I want to believe it was pirates who came on board. A pirate in another bubble, <laughs> like the sumo wrestler, bu- you know, bubbles. And they were just like floating out in these sumo wrestler suits uh-huh. and stealing stuff from his bubble. I was trying to think of other people who traveled by bubble. And the only one I really came up with was Glinda the Good Witch. <laughs> she showed up in a bubble to meet Dorothy in Wizard of Oz. She and, and she also traveled by bubble um, when addressing the crowd in uh, the Broadway show Wicked. So if anybody was going to steal stuff, it might have been Glinda the Good Witch. But she probably would have been there and out with him not noticing, too. So that makes sense with her magics and and whatnot. True. If he had been going to Bermuda, though, I actually looked up the distance from St. Augustine to Bermuda by walking because I was curious (laughs) what it would tell me. And it says, sorry, we could not calculate walking directions from St. Augustine, Florida to Bermuda. Ah, that's a shame. I like to think that if he had been successful and had been going to Bermuda, he would have put those directions in himself, sent it to Google and said... (laughs) No, I think it is possible, and here's how you do it. And then Google would also have been able to generate a traffic report saying, you know, as long as you got (laughs) the manpower to get there, or the hamster power, go for it. Yeah, I thought that would be fun if he had made it and sent something like that to Google. So how much money did he end up raising for all these charities? Because he did it for charity, right? Like a million billion dollars? I assume none since he didn't actually complete the journey. Oh. Usually they do it based on like the number of miles and stuff you travel, right? I mean, I don't know. Riza, he's a political refugee from Iran, and I don't know if they have the same crowd-sponsored mileage type uh, background. There is irony here in the fact that he was part of what he was doing is raising money for the Coast Guard. And in fact, it cost the Coast Guard money to then extract him from his thing. Probably quite a bit of money with running that equipment out, putting all the people on it, fuel, everything. I'm sure it cost them a ton of money. They did say that he could attempt it again as long as he hired a support ship to travel with him. 
ah, which defeats the purpose and he doesn't have the money. He did indicate somewhere that that was pretty much all the money he had. He was raising money for homeless because he had been homeless at one point. Yeah. All this crazy walking on water aside, though, you know, I mean, you mentioned he's a political asylee from Iran. Yeah. If he accomplished half of the things I read and saw on news stories, then this man's an endurance athlete's endurance athlete. I think I saw something like he competed on a national cycling team. And you had mentioned in the original text running the outside of the contiguous United States, which this is Forrest Gump type stuff happening for real. Yeah, he was on that national biking team. He was discovered at 14. He rode his bicycle out of Iran mm. uh, and just never came back. And he rode his bicycle around the world, ended up in South America, was riding his bike up through South and Central America, through Mexico was camping in Arizona someplace, waiting for his request for political asylum to be heard, but he was uh, arrested for being in Arizona, said it was a mistake. <laughs> he said he was in Mexico and he just kind of accidentally wandered across the border. Suppose that could happen. Yeah. He has run across the United States twice and around its perimeter, like we talked about. Oh. So he rode 50,000 miles through 55 countries on his bicycle peace tour. <laughs> Ended up in the United States, was given political asylum so he could finish that bike ride basically across the world. But instead of biking, he told the judge he was going to walk or run. And so he did. And he wasn't just running. He was running fast and he was running far. 58 miles in a day, every day for 200 days. I, how is that even possible? I don't know. It's amazing. Yeah. Even if the hydropod has not really worked out well so far. I mean, I, I suppose you can't really doubt him. The man has been crazy successful. He's at least as good at traveling around as Glinda the Good Witch, I guess, traveling in a bubble. Well, I'm sure people were laughing at him. Yeah. But people probably laughed at the Wright brothers. Pilatre de Razier and his hot air balloon. John Joseph Merlin and his roller skates. Mm. John Venn when he was trying to explain his diagrams. Mm. Maybe 100 years from now, people will listen to our podcast and laugh at me for thinking Ray Bellucci's idea was crazy. Yeah, I, I think Reza Bellucci is pretty impressive, even in his failures, but certainly in his successes. You know what I have to say about all of this uh, doubting people? No. Two wrongs don't make a right, but two rights can make an airplane. And they can do it in Ohio. Boom! Well, since we're talking about Ray Reza and his impressive watercraft, I did want to look a little bit into other watercrafts that might be unique or different. And there are plenty of articles and things about those. Many of the watercrafts that they ended up showing were shared between lists, but a lot of them were just like, okay, this is a truck that is somehow put on some sort of pontoons and becomes somebody's boat. There was a Japanese artist that made a boat that looked like a zipper so he could zip down the river. There was an Australian singer who got a uh, guitar company to make him a boat that looked like a guitar, which I think he auctioned off afterwards for charity. I got a little bit more excited when I heard about the boat called Plastiki. <laughs> have you heard of Plastiki, Brad? I have not heard of Plastiki. Plastiki was a 60-foot catamaran made from 12,500 recycled plastic water bottles. The water bottles were still intact, so I guess repurposed water bottles, as well as some other reclaimed material. And this was a boat created by a uh, very wealthy environmentalist, David de Rothschild. He had a small crew who wanted to raise awareness for the condition of the Pacific Ocean, in particular, how much plastic is in the ocean. So he gets these master maritime builder people to help him build this thing with the key floating component being the plastic bottles filled with carbon dioxide to provide stability and buoyancy. It's over 6,000 nautical miles from San Francisco here in the United States to Sydney, Australia. How long do you think it took them? They did succeed in traveling this distance on this catamaran with water bottles as its base. How long do you think it took them to go from San Francisco to Sydney? So Plastiki, like Contiki, like Thor Heyerdahl's Contiki? Yes, it's based on that. Oh, okay. Uh, how long? 27 days. Took 128 days. So really close. Really, really close. <laughs> I feel really good about that. They also were powered in part by solar power, wind, and sea turbines. They had an exercise bike to power their laptops and other technology on board. But they did cover over 6,000 nautical miles about 12,000 kilometers getting from San Francisco to Sydney, and it was a successful mission. But even that seems straightforward. The coolest, interesting watercraft thing I came across is probably not all that rare. I suspect there are a lot of listeners who did know about it. 
Do you have any experience with or knowledge of cardboard boat races? I don't believe that I do. No, I don't think I do. I was going to say maybe there was something with Red Bull that I have seen where they did some cardboard racing, but I don't think that's what that was. Cardboard boat races happen in quite a few places around the United States, often affiliated with college campuses or festivals in smaller communities. They happen around the world as well. The first documented event is often attributed to happening in Southern Illinois University in 1974 when they held the Great Cardboard Boat Regatta. I did see some evidence looking back. Some people were saying, well, that's not really when it started. And they were giving credit to a class instructor in the design department. And I looked at the actual assignment details today that somebody had saved and put online. Back in 1962, the class assignment was basically to build a boat out of cardboard and it had to make it a certain distance. I feel like that one might have been 100 yards or meters or something along those lines. But that initial assignment, or wherever it came from, that's the first on record, spawned this race at Southern Illinois University, which has been going on for almost a half century now. And then other people picked up on it too, which is where it becomes a story for us, well, here in our part of the heartland, Illinois is certainly part of the heartland as well. But there is a town called New Richmond, Ohio, down near Cincinnati. You take the river down, the Ohio River down towards Cincinnati. Just before you get to Cincinnati, you'll end up in New Richmond. And they have not only their own international cardboard boat regatta, but they have a cardboard boat museum as well. So you could actually go and check this out. How successful do you think cardboard boats are, Brad? I suppose there's some pretty hefty cardboard that can last a little while. Yeah, it really depends on who's making it. So these boats have gotten much better. In the early days, when some people in New Richmond, Ohio, decided to have their inaugural race in 1993, it was just a handful of locals. And some of them were literally just putting a piece of cardboard on the water and trying to float, which obviously didn't result in incredibly high amounts of success. But over the years, the boats have gotten much more elaborate. Some of them come out and look like kayaks and canoes. But people are making all different shaped things from Model T cars to Batmobiles, which play music. There was a floating toilet that had been made out of cardboard. People have all these different designs. I've found a lot of facts about this cardboard boat museum and cardboard boat regatta in New Richmond, Ohio, from an article in Smithsonian Magazine in 2021 by Jennifer Billick. And it was talking about how the next week, which would have been the beginning of August, there's a festival there happening again this year. And people can come in and join this regatta. These days, about 95% of the people who join this cardboard boat race make it the distance, Hmm. uh, which in this case is 200 yards. In the early days, about 75% of the boats sank. So they went from a 25% success rate to a 95% success rate, which is pretty good. And then this museum opened. There was actually a flooded out gas station in New Richmond right along Front Street. And they took this flooded out gas station, initially a couple of enthusiasts from the town who competed to work on their own boats. But then they inherited somebody else's boat, which was just going to be thrown away, but they picked him up. You can find the pictures of these boats, though, that are made. They actually have a division, which is for river boats with the spinning, with almost a hamster wheel spinning on those. And they give out different awards at the end of the race, including things such as highest speed, most durable boat, best team costumes, and best paddle wheel boat. But the crowd favorite, according to Jennifer Billick in the Smithsonian Magazine article, and actually according to some other articles for other races I read about, The Failure Boat Award seems to often be called the Titanic Award, which is for the most spectacular sinking. So if you want to know all about these, I've seen some pictures of the museum. Only opens a couple times a week, very limited hours. But when you go in there, you'll see all these crazy elaborate designs that are all over the place. Some of the boats have even won the race. Some of the boats have won the race more than one time. One of the main boats from these people who call themselves Team Lemon, a couple of brothers named Lemon and a couple of their friends, one of their boats has allegedly been on the water at this point for over 60 miles total. Not all at once, but it's pretty good when you can put it back in the water that many times. Right. I I guess it must dry out pretty well and it must not have gotten too rotted. Yeah. Waterlogged. Looking further into this, there's the Regatta Southern Illinois. There's this big international race that has people coming in from all over the United States, Finland, and all these places. 
There is another one that I happened to read about, and there could have been dozens and dozens of more if I had delved into it. But in Washington College, which is in Chestertown, Maryland, that's out on the eastern part of Maryland on the Delmarva Peninsula, they have an annual cardboard boat race. And I was reading about their race. Theirs is 300 meters long, so a little longer. And you either need to be affiliated with the university or live in a couple of counties nearby. But they were kind enough to provide me a list of building tips. If you were going to build a boat, any thoughts as to what main tips you would think might be on such a list? Are you allowed to use like bubble wrap and stuff underneath your cardboard to like help you float? There seem to be a couple different divisions at some races. Some are very much purists where they will quite literally provide all the competitors with the same stack of Ah. cardboard and you make it. But the more elaborate boats are obviously worked on well ahead of time. I think the Lemons have said that they've spent something like 500 hours building some of their boats. Some some of them certainly not that long. But yes, using other objects A lot of times it's for decoration only Mm. that you're allowed to use other objects as long as it's not contributing to the floating. Uh, Like a flower in the Rose Bowl parade. The float doesn't move because it has flowers. They're just there for decoration. (laughs) Sure. Some of the other rules that they gave is uh, not so much the thickness of the pieces of cardboard itself, but how many layers do you want to have? So the lemons in New Richmond and these tips both suggest that you layer the cardboard, you alternate the corrugations. They all talk about painting it and how paint essentially helps to seal the boats, but you got to use the right kind of paint. You don't want it to be water soluble. Same is what type of tape you use. Duct tape apparently shrinks when it's painted and it also shrinks differently than the cardboard. All the sources seem to suggest using a latex-based primer and using a paper tape. This list of tips, number 12, suggested that you practice with a manila folder and build a miniature version of your boat. Put some rocks in it and test it to see if it'll float. But my favorite rule, rule number 14, is wherever you're building your boat, make sure that it's going to be small enough to fit out the door from the room that you built it in. (laughs) You can build the world's greatest cardboard boat. But if you can't get it out of the place where it was built, it doesn't do you any good on the Ohio River or whatever the case may be. That is an important tip. (laughs) I also tried to find some interesting facts about watercraft. And I did run across a naval battle between Uruguay and I believe Brazil. Mm. And uh, the admiral for the Brazilian side and the admiral for the Uruguayan side. They used to work together, but the guy from Uruguay left Brazil and defected and started running the Uruguayan Navy. And he had lost a couple of times to the guy in the Brazilian Navy. Mm. So they were going to have this big decisive battle. And he tried to learn from his mistakes and he stayed safe in the harbor. He was protecting himself. He was waiting, is waiting. And the Brazilian admiral comes in, sees that he's not coming out and starts to leave. So the Uruguayan guy takes off. They leave really Mm. fast. He's thinking, oh, they're running away. It was a feint. They weren't really running away. They were trying to draw them out of the protection of their harbor. In his hurry to get out of the harbor, it turns out he didn't think about loading enough cannonballs onto Uh their ships. So they're fighting this battle. It's starting to get, you know, into a pitched battle. And all of a sudden, the cannons stop firing. And the guy's like, why are the cannons not firing? This isn't great. (laughs) And so the guy comes up sheepishly from underneath and says, we have no more cannonballs. What are we going to do? And so he thinks, being the industrious admiral that he is, he says, when we were getting ready to leave, we did pack a lot of food on board. And I remember (laughs) seeing this really hard cheese. Food fight. So they had this Edom cheese, this Dutch cheese that had spoiled, basically, and gotten really hard. And they put it in the cannons. They didn't really believe it was going to work. They shot a couple volleys and nothing happened. And then they shot a third volley and they got lucky. They hit the main mast. Some of the cheese splintered and killed a couple of the Brazilian sailors with cheese shrapnel. Hmm. And it was enough to make the Brazilian Navy run away. Run away! Which was good because they were also now out of cheese. (laughs) So he won his battle and he won his battle with cheese. Nice. Brad, I have a question for you about cheese. Do hamsters eat cheese? I don't know what hamsters eat. I don't either, but brilliant segue alert. They they are rodents, so maybe. They are. Speaking of rodents and hamsters and all those things, the original text talked about a person traveling in a floating hamster wheel. We as humans, when we're talking about a situation in life where we're in a hamster wheel, we're basically saying it's an endless situation without goals or achievement. Right. 
that's not necessarily how a hamster would look at it. In fact, it's a pretty essential piece of equipment in a hamster habitat because in real life, hamsters would be out foraging and building nests and may go for miles and miles a night. I saw one thing saying a hamster might go 10 miles in the wild every night. And it seems, even though I've never owned a hamster, that hamsters love to run in their hamster wheels, especially overnight in houses too. And many of them will go anywhere from four to five to six miles on their hamster wheels in the course of a night. But they're covering a lot more ground than I would have thought. And the scientific experiment that I thought was pretty interesting is that some scientists wanted to test, are they only doing it because they're bored out of their minds? And I'm sure that's a part of it. But they did take hamster wheels, put them out in nature, and they found that animals, if they kind of lured them to the area with some food just so they'd get in range of it to check it out, they would then find these rodents and mice running on the hamster wheel, even though they had full access to the world around them. So there seems to be some kind of instinct that makes hamsters really want to, even in the wild, run on these hamster wheels. Huh, interesting. I thought that was very cool. And then that led me into another thing. Which was, which other animals might be running on wheels? I've seen some dogs spinning wheels that helped to power things in the kitchen in the 19th century. They sell cat wheels. There are other animals that are using wheels. So I did a Google search that was something along the lines of animal wheels. And I got a search which really had nothing to do with it in the way that I was talking about. I stumbled across an article called, Why Don't Any Animals Have Wheels? Meaning, instead of legs, animals having wheels. There were a number of things addressing the subject, but I found an article on LiveScience.com from 2012 written by somebody named Natalie, her last name I can't probably pronounce, it's Walchover, and she wrote this article, Why Don't Animals Have Wheels? I love the first couple of paragraphs because it really just made me think about evolution and, and how animals have all these other skills that have developed. Let me just read those two paragraphs. From the magnetic compasses of migratory geese and dolphin sonar to beaver dams and ant agriculture, most of the ingenious stuff we as humans have invented arose millions of years ago in nature via the slow but steady process of evolution. So why not the wheel? Animals flap, flutter, float, run, walk, and hop. They swim, slide, skate, oscillate, glide, and paddle. Occasionally, they even curl up into balls and tumble head over heels but not one animal rolls around upon a rotating body part, a biological wheel. If I ask you, Science Brad, why would an animal, any animal, a human, be able to evolve in a way that has, this article specifically mentioned, the eye, this very complex piece of equipment? Why would an animal be able to evolve an eye, but not a wheel? Shade your eyes, Brother Jeff, for I'm about to blind you with science. <laughs> okay. What, what do you know? I Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I feel like if we wait long enough, perhaps it will happen. There weren't naturally roads, so having evolved wheels wouldn't make a lot of sense if you were a creature in the jungle. If you had evolved to have wheels, you probably aren't going to procreate very much because you're not going to survive because it's going to be really hard to get around. Yeah. The science of how an eye could develop, according to evolutionary biologists, they say that from the point where animals had nothing even related to an eye, to having an eye similar to what we would think of an eye today, only took about 400,000 years. It would take a lot of time if we wait around for those wheels to develop. But the real problem, as stated by the author in this article, was you can develop an eye little by little. First, you might have a patch of light-sensitive cells. And mm -hmm. then it might be more of a divot in the face area and then different parts of the eye develop in there. And in stages, they can continue to provide you benefits. But if you start developing a wheel, but you don't finish it, it's useless. It can't really evolve by degrees over time unless, you know, generations of things are going to be rolling around on their square wheels to start with. But there was also one other very good reason. A wheel as complex and important of a design as it is, is also very simple. It's a cylinder revolving around a fixed axle. But how would an animal species develop something resembling an axle? Well, probably easily enough. But how do you then have a freestanding cylinder that can rotate around that axle without there being any connected tissue or things just getting completely tied up? Yeah. I can see where that would be an issue, but I also just, generally speaking, it doesn't make a lot of sense because of all the obstacles that would have been in a wheel. If they had developed wheels, 
they wouldn't have had to develop wheels. They would have to develop like those fat tire bike wheels. <laughs> yeah, they would have. Speaking of interesting inventions or adaptations to your environment, this hamster wheel running had me thinking a little bit about all the inventions that have been made to cater to endurance athletes. Oh. And that's this is nothing new. It's been happening for a long time. Mm-hmm. Shoes. You know, I, I have GPS in my shoes to track my run. I don't even have to wear my GPS watch anymore. And you have shoes. And I have shoes. Although there are some great runners who don't run in shoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is that. I spent a little bit of time researching different inventions for endurance athletes to see if I could find any crazy tools that people were using. And and I came up with things like the elliptical bike and stuff that aren't really all that crazy. They're just taking an idea of something like a treadmill or an elliptical and moving it outdoors. Mm -hmm. However, and this is something that Mr. Belushi might have been interested in. He might have been interested in it. It's called the automaton. So like automaton, but without the ah part, it's tamatan. Yeah. And it's a Japanese invention. It was invented by Kagomi, Japan's largest supplier of tomato juice and ketchup. So the internet tells me. Mm. They built a robot that you wear on your back over your shoulders, kind of like a backpack, but sitting higher up on your shoulders that feeds you tomatoes while you run hands free. <laughs> that is very, very useful. The video for the robot is amazing. They roll this dude out in a suit. Well, they don't roll him out. He walks out in his suit and he gets on a really chintzy treadmill that looks like it's going to fall apart at any moment. Mm. And he demonstrates how it works. It's phenomenal. Watching this guy run on the treadmill with this robot on the back and he pulls on the robot's legs, grabs the tomato out of its back, the robot's back, and pulls it over its head and puts it right in front of the guy's mouth and its two little hands and he just eats the tomato right while he's running. Tasty. Yeah, it was amazing. I could envision myself wanting a tomato feeding robot that I could wear around, but it's 18 pounds and I don't really feel like that's conducive to endurance running, but there you have it. Good call. Well, I think we've taken this conversation about everywhere we can, but there's one man who we haven't heard from yet. He's our father art, and we're going to ask him some questions. How far do you think you could journey in a floating, human-sized hamster wheel in open water? Probably 100 yards. Would you attempt to navigate from Miami to New York City in a floating hamster wheel? No. Are you afraid of the water? Uh, or hamster wheels? Uh, hamster wheels more than the water. Gotcha. Uh, would you do any better on land, do you think? In a hamster wheel? Yes. Uh, no. Is there a time when you could have done better in a hamster wheel on land? Probably. I mean, I, I I did run 10K races, but not very fast. And not in a hamster wheel? And not in a hamster wheel. Now it, and I probably would have had difficulty because you have to raise your arms. <laughs> have you ever considered traveling to Bermuda on foot? Uh, no, but I did have a, a brother that uh, served in World War II in Bermuda. Oh. He said they were looking for submarines. Well, he he was he was building roads and buildings so others could look for submarines. Ah. What do you know about Florida Man? Uh, absolutely nothing. But I I'm not a big fan of Florida in general, so I'm guessing I wouldn't like them. Why Why are you not a big fan of Florida? In I I just it's it's too hot, too many uh, bugs and and uh, danger snakes. and snake snakes. and snakes, snakes. Yeah. <laughs> and snakes. Yes, I'm against snakes. Me too. What do you know about the stink ape? Oh, nothing. But if it's anything like the stink bug, uh, I'm not a big fan of, of stink ape either. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we're prepared to say about the Tomaton, rodents running for miles, the evolution of eyeballs, Glinda the Good Witch, cardboard boat regattas, and animals with wheels. But fear not, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange, there will be another episode coming your way. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked or what you didn't like, or to tell us about something that we got totally wrong. 
You might even have enough time to go tell a friend, an enemy, and a total stranger to give us a listen as well. If you manage to do any of that, the Fraternity of Drew Yards will be forever grateful. But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. What species do you think would do well with wheels? I believe lizards would make great wheel havers. They're, they can have legs. They can have no legs. As we know, they can have, be legless lizards. They could also have wheels. I think lizards would be great. Lizards would be great. I'd put them on birds to help them land. I would actually like to put on birds seaplane legs yeah, so they yeah. can land exactly like airplanes in a harbor. Yeah, I'd like them to land like airplanes on a runway. That'd be fun to watch. Yeah.